The Gospel of Mark, we are in chapter 6 of this brief little book we call the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we're going to explore here the servant, which is one of his titles for the Lord Jesus Christ, rejected. Opposition is going to develop. Will anyone trust God's servant? Remember in Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And that's what we'll be exploring here a bit. God takes unbelief seriously. And so should we. So should we. We should be on our guard there. So we're going to, in the first 13 verses, explore the unbelief of his acquaintances. Then we're going to explore the unbelief of his enemies. And then the unbelief of the disciples themselves. So this is what chapter... 6 is going to primarily focus on. Verse 1, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. What would that be? Nazareth, okay? Nazareth. Now, just to give you a little perspective there, he's going back to his hometown where he was raised. And we say most people don't realize that his boyhood days were uh, not happy days. And we, uh, we're going to take a quick glimpse at that. His early years. There is a psalm, by the way, which has hints about the silent years of Christ's childhood and young manhood, of which the Gospels hardly tell us anything. Dr. Luke, in his Gospel, does tell us a little about one incident when he was 12, uh, when he, uh, uh, about the temple and all of that. But other than that little episode in Luke, we know very little about his boyhood years. But in Psalm 69 gives us a few hints of those early years. In verse 8, it says, I am become, and by the way, Psalm 69 is one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament, but not for these reasons. There's some other aspects that cause it to be quoted quickly. But here's something often overlooked. I, be, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. What a strange expression to use until you realize the strange family he was in. You can can imagine the kids when they came home from school. Gee, they don't know who Jesus' father is. You see, the other other children had Joseph as their father. Jesus was, as we would say, apparently illegitimate. Can you imagine living in a small Jewish town with the general consensus being that Mary and had Jesus illegitimately. Wow, I've become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Why not the father's children? See, Mary had other children, as we will learn here in another couple of verses in Mark. But uh, he became an, an alien to his mother's children, not his father's children, because Joseph was not his father. They were half-brothers and half-sisters, technically, as we might designate them. We can only conclude it was a very unhappy home. Can you imagine the tensions there? Can you imagine the mood they're in? Can you imagine what Mary put up with for 30 years and more? But this also teaches, incidentally, what lies behind Psalm 69 is the virgin birth. The virgin birth. We find it tucked away in so many places throughout the Bible. And... uh, Matthew mentions it's not the same thing that we're going to discover in verse 3. We haven't got there yet. We will only got another verse or two. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? So we know he had a plurality of sisters. We know more than one. We don't know how many. And he obviously had uh, 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 four, uh, uh, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, four uh, brothers, or we, as we would say, half-brothers. Next verse says, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The reproaches of them that reproached me are fallen. The the reproaches of them that reproach thee, God that is, are fallen upon me, he says. How interesting. That the zeal of my house, that that is quoted in John. Remember when he found the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the change of the money sitting, and when he had made a scourge of small scourges, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. That must have made him popular. Huh? And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And then the disciples remembered that it was written, and that this is a 
quote from this first, Psalm, Psalm 69. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. But continuing Psalm 69, he says, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. In other words, when he was pious, they made fun of him even doing that, you see. I made sackcloth, also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. So he apparently was resented even for his devotion as a child. Remember in John 8, the Pharisees said, We're not born of fornication. See, this cloud of apparent illegitimacy hung over his life. Can you imagine that growing up as an impressionable kid? What that did, what kind of home he came from. But here's the one that gets to me. They that sit in the gate, in other words, that's like city hall. The gate was the, where the town's leadership met. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. Wow. See, the drunkards at the local bar made up dirty little ditties about him and his mother. He was a, he was a subject of, of, of all of that. Why did he endure all of this? You know, we often think of Christ suffering on the cross, and indeed he did, as is so graphically demonstrated, like even in the movie The Passion and others, we're sensitive to the physical aspects of, this, of the cross. But we often overlook the 30 years of suffering that he put up with. Why did he do all this? He was raised in a town where he was called illegitimate in order that you and I might be the legitimate son of God. The son of God bore that for me on the cross. He paid the penalty for my sins. And I suspect that you and I have no idea what he endured for those 30 years in order that we, you and I might have clear title to be a legitimate son of God. Interesting antithesis here. How ironic it is because he has the most distinguished genealogy in the history of the planet. It was encrypted in the Torah in Genesis 38, among other places. It was prophesied in the Judges, like in Ruth 4, the last few verses of that. It evades the blood curse on Jeconiah that we often highlight when we get into this as we study the virgin birth and all of its ramifications. Wow. Well, okay, that's a detour. Let's get back to the second verse of the Gospel of Mark. And when on the Sabbath day he was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now stop and think about that. I mean, here's a guy that grew up there, and they regard him as illegitimate. Now he is teaching in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath he this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Boy, they're, you know, at this point, there's enough awareness that they're impressed. These were the people who thought they knew him well. They were from his hometown. They had been his neighbors for 30 years. You miss all that, you see, without a perspective here. I thought I'd try to uh, include that in our perspective as we go here. See, on a previous occasion, he was there. They tried to throw him off a cliff. That's all recorded in Luke chapter 4. And here's a second chance they've got. But very little learning seems to have taken place. And learning is often defined as the modification of behavior. Have they changed? Not a lot. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Nothing's changed, has it? And uh, is not this the carpenter? Now we always think of him as the carpenter. The word is tecton, which actually means a builder is what it really refers to. We think of a carpenter as a woodsmith kind of guy. He actually is a builder. It can mean a craftsman, a worker, but it can also mean a planner or an architect, what we would call an architect. So we really don't know what specific skill it was. It's commonly thought that he was a simple carpenter replacing Joseph, who apparently had died by then. Every Jew, even the rabbis, learned a manual trade. That was the practice. Every, every able-bodied male was supposed to have a trade of some kind. Paul was a tent maker. The context of this remark implies a humble village carpenter. But then again, that's a presumption there. Other scholars have other, uh, other conjectures about his background. It's not this the carpenter, the son of Mary. 
See, that is actually an insult. In that culture, you always identified a man by his father. So calling him the son of Mary, again, seems to hint of the same cloud over him. The brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon, and are not his sisters with us. A family of at least seven, there may have been more. Four brothers and at least two sisters. The Roman Catholic position, as with many other of their views, is a contradiction to the Scriptures. And uh, Jesus was indeed Mary's firstborn, we find out from Matthew 1. But Mary actually did become the wife of Joseph and had other children. The Scripture says so in several places. So just, uh, just as a, a point, not a big deal except to realize that's one of the differences between our views and the Roman Catholic position. They look to the church as their ultimate authority. We cling to the Word of God in its, in its original form as being um, without error. In any case, they were offended at him. Literally, they stumbled over him, if you will. They couldn't quite swallow that this guy that they had a, as a neighbor for 30 years is actually who he is. He indeed was a stone of stumbling to those of unbelief. That term is used in Isaiah 8 and Romans 9 and 1 Peter 2. The stone of stumbling is, a, is one of the labels that we use of Yeshua. The Greek word that's used here is scandalizo, which is the word from which we get the word scandalize. That sort of captures the flavor of being stumbled over scandalizing. They were offended at him. Moving on, Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. A familiar proverb that we've heard many times. And he reminded that of what he told them at that first visit in Luke 4. He mentioned it there in John 4. A prophet's not with honor, except in, among his own kindred. Publius, the Syrian, back to B.C., said, Familiar Familiarity breeds contempt. You've probably heard that. May not know, have known where that came from, but that's anyway an old thing. You see, our own land, our own country, is familiar, in quotes, with Jesus, but there's a tendency to become gospel hardened. We hear about Jesus so much we take him for granted, or we sort of dismiss it. We it loses its impact. That should strike if we really appreciate who he is, it should strike awe and reverence in us every time we hear that word, rather than just a street term used in, in, as an expletive. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. What is limiting God among, in your life? God is omnipotent, but he always works according to the laws of his own being and the laws of his attributes. He won't force himself on you. But invite him in and see what happens. Christ had all the power, but he would not force his blessings on those who do not wish to receive them. He will not violate our sovereignty either. Strange idea. We need to understand that. If any man will open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. But the latch key is on your side of the door. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around the villages teaching. Marveled. Is it possible for Jesus to marvel? Think about it. It's the only twice that the scriptures say that he marveled. Here he's marveling at the unbelief of the Jews. Marvel implies that he's surprised. I don't think he's really surprised. I think it's an anthropomorphism that we're using here. But still, he's he's amazed, if you will, at the unbelief of the Jews. The other case he's going to mention is at the faith of the centurion in Matthew 8 and Luke 7. He's marveled at a centurion, a Gentile centurion, had faith. He was impressed, is a way to put it, I guess. See, faith is more than belief. James tells us the devils also believe and tremble. Faith is more than belief. It's belief plus a total commitment. One or, might, or one might say a total reliance. I believe this chair will hold my weight. I don't have faith in it until I'm sitting in it and relying on it. 
clumsy example perhaps, but I think you understand. I can believe anything I want to believe about that railing or that table. It means nothing until I'm relying on it. That's placing my faith on it. Well, just have faith. They always say, just have, see a lot of stories and movies and stuff. Just got to have faith. What nonsense. What if you have faith in the wrong thing? It's not having faith. It's having faith in what? Be careful what you place your faith in. It's more than just belief. It's faith plus a total commitment. Salvation is more than an insurance policy against the flames of hell. Salvation is a new creation, a new life, a new love, and a new direction of the will. Jesus' heart was broken here as he saw the desperate plight of the people. And that's emphasized in Matthew 9. And uh, it's also going to be emphasized here before we're all through. And he called unto him the twelve. And I like that term, the twelve. You know, there is a group of 70, but within that there's a group of the 12. The 12 is like a title. It's a group. And uh, the 12. And he began to send them forth, two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Wow. Interesting, among those 12, there's a guy by the name of Judas Iscariot. He was among the 12 at this point. He also went out with them two by two, apparently, and he apparently joined into this thing here. Send them forth. The word is apostello. That's where we get the word apostle comes from. The one that is sent forth. And we use that term strictly as one that was an eyewitness sent forth literally by him there. Some people use that term a little more broadly. But uh, others use it more restrictively. But in any case, in order to, to, he's sent to a place appointed. And that's where we get the word apostle or the sent one if you will. It's interesting, he sent them forth two by two, always in pairs. That's kind of interesting. If you review the lists of the disciples all through the scripture, they're always given in pairs. That's kind of it. James and John, Peter and Andrew, his brother, so on. The law always required two witnesses. See, the law in Deuteronomy 17 and 19. It takes two witnesses to establish something. Not one witness was enough. Two witnesses. It's always two. Two are better than one, apparently. And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. That sounds like pretty poor planning to me, doesn't it? Should take nothing for their journey. Save a staff only. No script, no bread, no money in their purse. Ouch. Wow. What's the point here? You see, I think God... Every day, asks each one of us, do you trust me? There are a lot of other examples. Sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. Take no thought for the morrow. Does that mean you shouldn't plan? No, not really. Don't, don't, don't extrapolate from that. But it does mean what you rely on is him. Not on your bank account. Not on your career seniority. Or whatever. No, no. Every day, God will challenge you. Do you really trust him? And he delights in having people trust him, not relying on their own savvy. And be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. Don't even take an extra coat. He said to them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. What does that mean? Well, that means we're going to have a house-to-house -house canvas. I don't think so. They were not to pick and choose. They were to be profitable servants, not pampered guests. There was to be no ground for the suspicion that they were seeking personal comfort or special recognition. You go house to house. And you stay in the, when you pick a house, you stay there until you leave. Strange. And whosoever shall not receive you, uh-oh, nor hear you, when you depart, then shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. If you go into a city, pick a house. If they don't treat you well, split. Go. Shake the dust off. Wow. Wow. That doesn't sound like a good marketing research kind of thing, does it? Boy. I don't know what Rick Warren would do with this, but we'll move on. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many 
demons. The word is devils, but that's sort of a clumsy translation. There's only one devil. There are many demons. They cast out many devils or demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Wow. Anointed with oil. That's what James 5 talks about. Oil is a type, of course, of the Holy Spirit. It's a type or an idiom of that. Let's talk a little bit about Herod. We're going to talk a little bit about Herod coming up here. Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, by his Samaritan wife, Malthus. And when Herod the Great died, the Romans divided the, his territory among three sons. Antipas was made the Tetrarch of Perea, that's on the east of the Jordan, and, and the Galilee, and reigned during the whole period of our Lord's wife on earth. So... Uh, Antipas is, uh, is, is the one that we run into a great deal uh, in, throughout the Scripture. Now, he was a frivolous and vain prince, was chargeable with many infamous crowns. He had a really bad reputation, and that echoes all through the Gospels. Now, he'd married the daughter of King Aretas IV, and then had divorced her so that he could marry Herodias, the wife of his half-brother Herod Philip. It was a wicked alliance. And uh, it's very parallel here to Ahab and Jezebel in 1 Kings 18 through 21. So there's an the echo. In fact, that particular alliance is alluded to by our Lord, idiomatically at least, in his letter to the church at Thyatira. In Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3, you have the seven letters to seven churches. Uh, Jesus makes an allusion to Herod as that fox. That fox. It's... Uh, it's very interesting as you study Jewish animals, the labels of animals, that some of them are clean and some are unclean. The ones that are clean are used in messianic allusions. The ones that are unclean are also used in epithets. You can make a whole study of that sometime if you're in the mood. It's uh, interesting uh, to realize how pervasive those idioms are used in the Scripture. Moving on, though, verse 14. King Herod heard of him... For his name was spread abroad and said, That John the Baptist was, a, has risen, was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. That's his presumption. He's got a guilty conscience here. His conscience is bothering him. See, when he heard of Jesus, he thought that was a resurrection of John the Baptist, who by now had been killed. And we're going to, it's going to explain a little bit why. For his name is spread abroad. That John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Now Mark's going to give us a flashback of why, what's the background here. This is out of chronological. He's going to look back and explain this in, in the next handful of verses here, shortly. Others said that it is Elias, meaning Jesus. Others said that he is a prophet, or one of the prophets. And uh, the, this mystery of the, uh, uh, of the identity of John the Baptist is also highlighted in John chapter 1, really gets into that. And we won't take the time to go through all the different theories and why they held them. Here, we do that in the Gospel of John. Let's move on here. When Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John I, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Why? Because Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And, of course, John the Baptist was calling public attention to the fact that that was an illicit relationship. That didn't go very, over very well with Herod. Now he, so John the Baptist was bound in prison, probably the Macharis prison, which is on the cliffs overlooking the Dead Sea. Is where we, uh, scholars generally believe that's where he was incarcerated. Why? Because John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And because of that, Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. It was all contrary to the, this all was contrary to the law of Moses, and that was John the Baptist's uh, point. Not like they say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Huh? And so she's like Jezebel II. So for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. But when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. It's really amazing, you think about it. The monarch, Herod Antipas, Antipas. Uh, this monarch feared his prisoner. The king feared his prisoner. Think about it. He privately listened to him preached. 
being uh, preached all the time. To continue. And when a convenient day was come that Herod had on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. Big party. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and we believe her name was Salome, that's where you get that, a lot of those legends and so forth, came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. Well, see, the Jews would not have permitted a woman to dance before a group of men. Most Gentile mothers would have forbidden the daughters to do what Salome did. But nevertheless, we go on here. So the king swears unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half of my kingdom. And most scholars believe that's a figure of speech, not literally, but nevertheless, he's making a very grand public gesture to reward her, reward her for this uh, uh, pleasing dance that she did. And she went forth and said to her mother, What shall I ask? The mother gave her the good motherly advice. <laughs> she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger, a large silver plate, the head of John the Baptist. Now it's got to shake up the king. He didn't really want to do that for a lot of reasons. He feared John. He also probably feared the public because John, had, even though he's in prison, he still had quite a following. But now he's on the, now he's, you know, on, uh, on the spot here. He's made this grand gesture in this banquet. And, uh, this is quite a compliment to John the Baptist. His head was considered to be worth more than half the kingdom. The king was exceedingly sorry. I can imagine so. He was trapped in a sense. Yet for his oath's sake, and how often we have to eat our words, huh? And yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel. The damsel gave this prized little package <laughs> to her mother. Famous event in history, obviously. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse, and laid it in the tomb. And they went and told Jesus, of course, Matthew 14 talks about this, don't feel sorry for John. He had a short trip to glory. He was, he's, he's, taken, he's well taken care of. Anyway, America too has lost its conscience, the voice of the moral conscience, because the preachers of this land have ceased to denounce sin. Herod got a chance to see Jesus just before his crucifixion, we record in Luke chapter 23. But Jesus didn't even give him a word. Herod's conscience was long dead and buried. Antipas's nephew, Herod Agrippa, denounced his uncle to the Roman emperor, and Antipas was deposed and sent into exile. That's in Acts chapter 12. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark is going to get into that in chapter 8, a couple of chapters from now. But moving on here, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come ye yourselves apart in a desert, into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. The people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. They were trying to find some privacy, but his popularity caused the crowds to, you know, to, to follow and beat them to the place they were going, and so the, they have this crowd still surrounding them. Have you ever had that kind of a schedule? <laughs> We've been feeling it lately, by the way, but in any case, Jesus, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, 
And now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. So they're out in the boondocks here with a huge crowd, and they're hanging on to the end of the day here. And someone has defined a committee as a group of people who individually can do nothing, but collectively can decide that nothing can be done. <laughs> we did many years ago, did a scientific study of the optimum size of a committee, and it turns out to be seven-tenths of a member, by the way. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Jesus answered and said to them, Give ye them to eat. And they said to them, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? They've got a crowd on their hands. No one's got the budget for this is the point, see? And by the way, the ye is emphatic in the Greek structure here. The ye is emphatic. And there, see, the amount required to purchase that much bread equates to about a year's wages. A penny worth. A penny, that's a Roman penny, a seven pence half penny. It was the daily pay of a Roman soldier in the time of Christ. In the reign of Edward III, an English penny was a laborer's day's wages. So it's, a, it's, it's 200 days uh, wages that would have, is an estimate of what it would cost if, if they could find a place to buy this. Said on them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. Apparently some kid, maybe, in the crowd had brought his lunch. <laughs> when they knew, they say five, five loaves and two fishes. In other words, a mere snack for someone, right? He commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Man, there must have been a crowd that they had to divide it up into hundreds and fifties and so forth. They got it organized here. And they sat down upon the green grass. Apparently it was from John, we understand it was Andrew, Peter's brother, who happened to discover the lad who apparently had brought his lunch. Two lo uh, uh, yeah, five loaves and two fishes. And uh, it's interesting, by the way, that only Mark includes this strange detail. That he sat down, the company's up on the green grass. Now why is it green grass? This is what a rabbi would call a remez. There's a hint of something deeper. And I'm going to leave it to you to go ahead and poke at this. What do we learn about the fact that the grass is green? First of all, you probably learn the time of year. And from this, it may have, there may be some implications. And so I'll leave that for you. To, it's always interesting where you have a, an unnecessary detail that behind that may be a very significant discovery. But we won't derail ourselves here going down that path this time. Let's go on here. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes... Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. Now does that mean that they somehow were satisfied with just two fishes? No. Somehow they were multiplied. Now how you would render this in a movie or a play or something I, is strictly speculative. But clearly it somehow multiplied. Why? Because they all did eat and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Twelve, in other words, they had left over from this exercises after everybody was satisfied, twelve baskets. Why twelve? Maybe a reason for that. And they did eat of the loaves were, that, that were about five thousand men. Now be careful with that one. It was Jewish practice to number crowds by the number of men present. How many were here? Well, if there's 5,000 men, you could probably presume there's probably 5,000 women. You're talking 10,000 people. And even by modern standards, that would be an ambitious group to cater to. Wow. Besides women and children, Matthew details in his account of this thing. Now, assuming an equal number of women and children, just using one, one for one here, uh, that, was, that was probably something like ten, the feeding of the 10,000. Obviously, you always speak of this as the feeding of the 5,000. Well, that's a misleading label because there's probably in excess of 10,000 people there. And they had a leftover basket for each of the disciples, perhaps? 
12 baskets left over. Well, 12 intrigues me because whenever you see seven in the Bible, you know that's a number of completeness as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. But 12 seems to be the kingdom number. The kingdom of heaven is always in 12s. There were 12 tribes. There are 12 apostles to rule over the 12 tribes. There are 12 kingdom of heaven parables. There are 12 kingdom mysteries. There are 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes. In the New Jerusalem, in Revelation 21, we have 12 gates. We have 12 foundation stones. The size of the New Jerusalem is 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 furlongs, cubically, apparently. So 12 somehow seems to be the number of the kingdom from heaven. But let's move on. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness, the psalmist asks us. I will satisfy her poor with bread, Psalm 132. Now John tells us that this miracle occasioned Jesus' sermon on the bread of life in John 6, from John 6 following, which is probably a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy by Solomon that constitutes the first four verses of Proverbs 30. The words of Agor. Who is Agor? The collector. Who is the collector? Solomon was. Collected dark sayings. And it was Ethiel and Ukal mentioned there. They're untranslated. Ethiel means God is, is, has arrived. It, Emmanuel, God is with us. Ethiel, God has arrived. Ukal means to be consumed. God arrives to be consumed? Weird idea. That's what Jesus amplifies in John 6 as a response to this miracle of the feeding. So I'll let you chase that down in John 6. We're going to move on. But these people who are amazed at the miracle of the feeding fail to get the spiritual message that's there involved. But in any case, we can continue verse 45. And straightway, here's that word again. Over 40 times in this little gospel, straightway, suddenly, quickly, forthwith. It's a move, it moves right along. It goes from action to action. It's like a shooting script. There's not much. It doesn't dwell a lot on sermons that talks about what's going on. This is Peter. This is the action item. And straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. One of the interesting things you can do is note how often Jesus prays and how often he does it all night long by himself somewhere. Wow. But anyway, they're on this other side. They, they, they send the, uh, the crowd away, take the ship over to Bethsaida, Bethsaida being on the north, um, northeast corner of the uh, Sea of Galilee. Now remember, in the previous storm, he was with them. This time, he is in the mountain praying for them. He was teaching them to live by faith. He sent them on this ship alone. He's in a mountain praying. They're on a ship heading to Bethsaida. There's going to be another storm, probably the more famous of them all. And this is us today, by the way. He's in glory interceding for us. It's exactly the model here. They're in the ship. He's in the mountain praying for them. He's uh, in the role of an intercessor in the meantime here. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. He would have kept on walking. <laughs> I think this is great. Now, toiling, this is the same term as the, as the word vexed in Second Peter 2 eight. Tortured. It implies real mental distress and anxiety. Now, these were not landlubbers. These were professional seamen. On the, most of them, a handful of them were, in, were for, uh, professional fishermen. And they were concerned that they might be swamped. Now, when it says the fourth watch, think of that as between 3 and 6 in the morning, just to give you a perspective there. He comes walking on the water. I love that. I always think about the Gnostics. You know, there are certain groups of the Gnostics that felt Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. He was really some kind of spirit. And they, they like to say that when he walked, he didn't leave footprints. And I love to point to this. this there, was, there was one occasion that we know of that Jesus didn't leave footprints. That's this one. 
because he's walking on the water. See? And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They've got to be impressed. I mean, that's got to be bizarre. I mean, it's one thing to read about as a story here. It's quite another to actually have been there and experienced this strange, strange event. What's also interesting here, in the other Gospels, this is recorded, but <laughs> in the other ones, it um, uh, uh, talks about Peter's response. Bid me to come with you. Come, come there too. Well, come on. And Peter starts to go until he looks down and he really starts sinking and the Lord has to take him out of there. Now Mark is, in effect, Peter's secretary, amenuensis. This is really, the Gospel of Mark is really Peter's Gospel. Mark is recording it. And it's interesting that the details of this event is not recorded. Peter didn't amplify all of that uh, in his account of what happened here. And uh, so Peter attempted to join Jesus. And that's all recorded in, in Matthew 14, for those who want to put that in your notes and compare the two accounts, you can go ahead and do that. And so, uh, I love this idea that, that this is one of the places where he didn't have, didn't keep footprints. Walking upon the sea, pretty weird stuff. Anyway, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hard. Not only see, not only did they have this experience on the stormy sea, but they just come from a place where there were ten thousand people fed miraculously. And they didn't really ex uh, understand the spiritual implications of that. Obviously amazed, not sure what to do with it. And I wonder if we're not guilty of the same thing. This is the most disturbing of them, of course, that they experienced all this and didn't integrate what it meant. But I think we're in the same boat. We read these stories and fail to really apprehend the significance of them. See, even a disciple of Christ can develop a hard heart if he fails to respond to the spiritual lessons that must be learned in the course of life and ministry. You want to appropriate yourself the spiritual lessons. The, 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 that's, the, that's the superseding overall impact of all of this. See, if you really understand who he is, None of these narratives should be surprising. They sound very strange to our ears because we don't fully comprehend who it is that's the subject of this whole uh, narrative. The creator of the universe became man and dwelt among us. Why should we be surprised from these bizarre uh, occasions? Well, moving on, when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret, which is the proper name of the Galilee. Gennesaret. It's a word similar to a, a harp. It's roughly the shape of a harp. And it's not a, it's not a sea that comes from a... It's by tradition called the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a lake. It's not a sea. But anyway, uh, the land of Gennesaret. And they drew up on the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. So you can imagine this. The word gets around, and every place he goes, there are crowds seeking healing, understandably. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, uh, if it were but a border of his garment. There's that hymns thing again. I won't go through that whole routine again. Just recognize that the hem of a garment, bo uh, the border of the garment, it, which it embodied the implied rank of the person. And it, sort of, it was sort of the, the site of the authority, if you will, in a sense like an insignia or something. That they might touch it if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Wow. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. The border of garments are the target. People say, have faith. That's an empty suggestion unless it is faith in him. It's not having faith. It's having faith in what? Be careful what you put your faith in. Because you will become like that which you put your faith in. Did you know that faith does not save us? 
There's a good one-liner to open your discussion with your weekly study group. You go to the doctor for surgery and put your faith in that doctor. He performs a service and you recover. Are you well because you had faith in the doctor? No. It wasn't your faith that saved you. The doctor did. What saves you is the object of your faith. You're saved not by your faith, but by the one in whom you trust. It is Jesus who saves us. Faith doesn't save us. Jesus does. It's your faith in Jesus that brings that appropriate. But it's, uh, it's important to understand because the word faith is so misused in our entertainment vocabulary, in movies and things. Oh, have faith, as if that somehow is, a, is, a, is an achievement. No. Faith in whom? In one case here, you have faith in the doctor, but it's the doctor that does the saving. You and I have faith in Jesus Christ, but it's Jesus that does the saving. Makes a big difference. Okay, so we got a short little lesson here. I think it will, this would be fine. Next time we're going to talk about the hazard of traditions. The hazard of traditions. And I want you to study Mark chapter 7 for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.